It's a great pleasure to be with you today. This is my first gig in front of real people, I assume you're real, in the last 18 months. So my life has changed completely because of COVID and I took it as a bit of a reset opportunity, I think like most people did, to rethink what is happening around us and to rethink what I do. You know, it's interesting when you think about how people change, uh, there's only two ways that humans change really, right? pain and love. Pain, we had pain, we have pain with COVID, right? Love, falling in love with new ideas. That's why we're here, the future of mobility, the future of our society. So I'm gonna share some ideas with you and we have a sort of uh, a short question and answer session at the end, so you can grab the microphone and contribute. I wanna kick off by saying or quoting E.O. Wilson, famous futurist and naturalist who said, that this is the real problem of humanity. We have Paleolithic emotions from the Stone Age, we have medieval institutions, no comment, and we have godlike technology. So the reality is, you know, we can solve most of the practical problems of our world. We can and we are solving with science and technology. But there are quite a few problems that are not science and technology. How we collaborate, what policy we want, what future we want. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what that means. I'm going to start here. If you haven't noticed, science fiction is becoming science fact. The flying taxi that's going to show up here shortly. That's kind of like science fiction, but yeah, people are talking about it right here. Right? The fully recyclable car, I read BMW presented that here. Right? Sounds like straight from science fiction. The idea that a computer can drive a car, can fly an airplane, I can upload my brain to the internet as Elon Musk is telling us we should do, right? Well, some of that should remain science fiction. <laughs> but think about this for a second. Eight years ago, I had a, a big workshop here near Munich, actually, for a bunch of leaders of the German car companies. I, we brought 10 other futurists. And we talked about electric cars, shared vehicles, autonomous driving, uh, and uh, everything around you know, the mobility aspect. And in the room of 30 uh, leading people, we got mostly some pretty strong laughter. Who would want to share their car? Like, especially in Germany, I think about this for a second, right? Share my car? You must be joking, right? Not own a car? No, 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 I want to definitely own my car. And here we are seven years later, and then the biggest topic here is not the car. <laughs> It's mobility. And it's a, it's a huge behavior change. Many of you are in the right age to remember when we, uh, we had Napster, no digital music. I used to be in the music business, right? And we wanted music to download on our devices. And so Napster provided this. And then very soon, I wrote a book called The Future of Music. And in the book, I said, music is moving to the cloud, right? Music like water. And guess who took that concept of music like water and made lots of money with it? Spotify, right? Good for them. But when I said this in 2000, I made enemies with every single person in the music business. Because what they said is music like water, you must be joking. We won't make money with music like water. Turns out, right, you're probably among that crowd, 158 million people are spending 10 dollars, 10 euros a month on Spotify to get access to 70 million songs, right? And after 10 years of decline, the music industry is growing again. The same thing will happen with cars, with mobility, with transportation. The same thing will happen, will happen with the oil and gas industry. Demise of one doesn't mean there isn't a future, it just means the future is different. Of course, the oil industry is in, in deep trouble for other reasons. We'll talk about that later. But science fiction is becoming science fact. You've seen, I mean, I, I put together some clips for this event. There were thousands right, about all the possibilities of what is happening around us. So I have three topics for you today. I call it the DDR. Uh, if you're German, you know the joke. You know, it's a pun. You know, I, I, I don't mean to you know, talk about East Germany. But digitization, decarbonization, and reformation. That is the future of mobility. I'll explain what that means. Right? 
I mean, it's all fine that we're sitting here and getting excited about electric vehicles and about, you know, having a better network and so on and so on. But before we do that, I want to talk briefly about what it means to talk about the future. And the most important thing to realize that the future is not about tomorrow. The future is here. I mean, if you haven't noticed, the future is actually everywhere to be seen. We're just not paying enough attention. Henry Miller, one of my favorite writers, he says, the future is never a place, but a new way of seeing things. That's what I would like you to get today, a new way of seeing things, new opportunities, new possibilities, and to open yourself up to different models. Right? Like in the music business, going from the CD to the cloud, the car from owning to sharing, the banks from buildings to cryptocurrencies. And that is, of course, going to be in so many ways a significant challenge. The masters of change, because we know them all, right? They're not the car companies. <laughs> well, they're working on that, right? But doing pretty good in comparison, right? I mean, look at the revenue streams of the digital companies. Why are they so wildly successful? Because they have a future mindset. They can operate today and imagine tomorrow. Jeff Bezos, no longer the CEO, but very important man still in the world, he says that he needs to have data and case studies and science to prove things that he wants to do. But in the end, he says, I make all my decisions with intuition, imagination, and gut feel. That is what we need. There's not going to be a case study showing you why it makes sense in the future to do X, Y, Z. It's a decision that you make. It is something that you think about, that you feel. The world, not just because of COVID, is not going back to normal. If you think that we're going back to normal, you are in deep trouble. We are not. We are going back to bars and restaurants and maybe uh, football stadiums and, and cinemas, hopefully even airplanes. There are some things that we shouldn't go back to, like cruise ships, different story. We're not going back to normal. And that is good because we're going to build back better, right? Now with COVID, we have a reboot. It's forcing us. Would you voluntarily sit in a room and wear a mask like people did in Japan a decade ago? Would you voluntarily comply with the state to tell you you can't do X, Y, Z? You wouldn't. Why are we doing it? Because we want a positive outcome, right? COVID is existential, and so we're complying. Climate change, existential. Artificial intelligence, existential. Human genome editing, existential. There are things that we're going to do that are different. Look at the music industry again. Where did the growth come from in the music business? It didn't come from Bertelsmann, EMI, Warner, Sony, Universal. It came from a 22-year-old Swedish guy. And, of course, Apple with a ludicrous idea of paying one dollar per song, right? I mean, talk about a crazy idea there, right? But this is the growth of, of the music industry. Now, in comparison to the car industry, what would happen in the US if w autonomous vehicles were widely adopted? You can see right here, right? The boost in safety, real estate, congestion. For some reason, the whole climate change <laughs> CO2 thing is missing in this chart. I don't know why, but that is, of course, the biggest benefit. Are we going to benefit from a, from a shift to electric vehicles, autonomous driving? All of us will benefit, including the industry, including the car makers, a whole new ecosystem. Let's not pretend for a minute this is optional. It's not. Just like we have seen decades ago, first protest against climate change, we're going to see a sort of a mild form of eco-terrorism. Right? Basically, scratched SUVs in the city Read the book, The Ministry of the Future, for the future, by Kim Stanley Robinson. There is going to be a giant wave of pushback against not getting ready for a better future, not getting ready for a future that is good for our kids. We're going to see a reality unforming, forming, that will be composed of a bunch of new normals, and that is the challenge. It's fragmented. Uh, many of you are Spotify or Apple Music users, I'm sure. And what do you listen to? Well, we all listen to completely different things now, right? You like Goa trance music? That's your place, right? African chanting? All on Spotify. 
No more need for Elton John or Madonna, right? Because he couldn't find anything else. And so what's happening now is that things that were considered are undoable, unthinkable, are the new normal, the carbon tax. Right? I'm talking about carbon taxes, okay? N way beyond the current <laughs> definition. Carbon tax for flying, for airlines, that is coming for sure, especially here. I live in Zurich, so I'm safe, but no, I'm kidding. I will pay it anyway. Carbon tax for meat. I mean, I'm not vegetarian, but the future is vegetarian. Right? I mean, it's a strange thing to say, right? It's like this is just no way that we can keep eating like we have, right? Just as a comparison to driving, you know, that is basically already happening with Memphis Meats. Look at this chart, right? This chart shows you how many people have invested in what's called meat from the lab, right? Cultured meat. I know you're disgusted now, right? This is actually meat that's grown in the lab, you know, cell by cell, but from the animal, right? They always say it's like no death involved, right? No cruelty involved. I tasted it about three years ago, and it tasted great. Only problem is $2,000 a pound, you know, it's kind of a problem. But this global meat consumption, right, this is a huge business. Who would have ever thought that we would consider this? Just like the car industry. We have to rethink, we have to think wider, we have to reinvent, we have to question our assumption. When I was in the music business, a record label told me, you know what, when music goes on the internet, nobody is going to pay, everything will be free. Turns out, not true. That's like, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a therapist with your husband or your wife, but if you've been married for a long time, <laughs> you know, you have assumptions. Like, you won't do this, you won't do that, you're like this, I'm like that, right? But it turns out it's not true. We actually are capable of change. Assumptions are not always true forever. And so now people are both excited and deeply worried about the future. Rich research from Ipsos recently showed the most, uh, the most uh, future positive countries around the world, guess where they are? India, Indonesia, Chile, Brazil, Nigeria, Thailand, the lowest common denominator in Europe is that we all feel bad about the future. France is the leader. Does that surprise you? Uh, Europe, not France, right? We think the future will be bad because, you know, we have all these problems we can't agree. Yeah. But it's of course, the reality is completely different. That's what we get from paying attention to social media. Here's the most important thing about the future of mobility. As you see the future, so you act. As you act, so you become. It's called self-fulfilling prophecy. You heard that before, right? This was a, a saying by Barbara Hubbard, who was a disciple of Buckminster Fuller, one of the most favored future, a famous futurists ever lived. Basically, if you expect the future to suck, to be bad, it will be. Right? Because you are saying, well, basically it can't be done. You know, the thing is, of course, I was born in Germany. I, I have a Swiss passport now as well, and I lived in America for 20 years. In America, when you go to a meeting, you talk about rebooting something from scratch, and say, well, that's really interesting, and we should investigate it, right? In Europe, we're saying, oh, you know, but we would have never sit here and think about the future of mobility. IAA would still just be cars, not mobility, if we weren't ready to think differently. Right? So I made a film called The Good Future. You should watch it. Because I really believe that the good future is possible, and that's why I'm here, because the good future has a lot to do with mobility, with smart cities, transportation, logistics, and everything else. So let me kick off on the first topic, digitization. I mean, if we're looking in this direction, it's a great quote here from Alvin Toffler, also a famous, uh, favorite, uh, famous futurist, who says, it is the framework with technology that changes, not the picture. It's not the fact that I'm using an app or not using gas, but using electricity. It's the framework, it's everything around it. This is the framework of mobility. Some of the things on here don't apply directly, but Clearly, big data, right? Cloud computing. Whoop, where is my pointer? Come back here. 
the Internet of Things, the blockchain, voice control. Uh, it's a long list. I call these the game changes. And all that stuff is present here. And this will completely reboot what we think about mobility and how we can do it. I mean, we're making leaps in technology. Once we figure out how to make batteries that don't use rare earth, earth minerals, think about that. Once we cross that border, 5,000 kilometers per filling. Right? I mean, <laughs> some people say in 10 years we only fill it up once on the battery. We think about that. I mean, that sounds like science fiction, right? But related to this are the mega shifts of society. And if you are a respons responsible player in mobility and transportation and cars, you have to think about the consequences. Automation, personalization, virtualization. And this is chapter three in my book. You can download for free this chapter in 10 languages at megashifts.digital. You should read it because it has a lot to do with mobility. But basically, it's a moving target. You take those two things together, the game changes, that's tech and science, and the game and the mega shifts, you have a perfect storm. And I mean this in a positive way, and definitely in a positive way. The next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. This is not American euphemism. Think about this for a second. Yeah, kids, you have to think about that. 10 years, 20 years, exponential change? Not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Right? We're leaping. And it didn't matter 10 years because it wasn't working. But now it is. Now we're leaping into the future in an entirely new way. And so when we look in this direction, it's really quite clear that one of the big things will be 5G and connectivity. No matter what you think about 5G and other issues around 5G, it's going to drive these changes. Here's four bottom lines that I like to talk about. Data is the new oil. This is an old hat. Right? I know you're going to laugh when you see this here. Virtual streamers, fellows. Right? But now data is also the new plutonium. can be used as a weapon. That's not a good idea. We should make sure that data is used cleanly and not as a weapon. AI is the new electricity. Artificial intelligence makes the world go round. When you use Google Maps, when you use Gmail, when you use whatever you're using, there's some piece of AI there. I'll talk more about AI in a second. The cloud is a new office, the new living room. That can be quite lonely, I know. And that's probably going to be more of a hybrid scenario. And virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, that is exploding because of COVID, right? That's the new senses, my new eyes, my new ears. All of these things are really amazing, but also very scary. Because technology, in many ways, is like a drug. You know, you all take drugs. We all take drugs of various sorts, whether it's beer or other alcohol or smoking or coffee or, yeah. And we don't make things illegal just because they could be dangerous, except for really dangerous things. <laughs> we have to figure out how to deal with it. We can't make these things like AI illegal, right? I mean, we have to figure out how to make the best out of it. And that's the future that is awaiting for us. That is the future that we're going into at mind-boggling speed. You, you know, of course, the Vitruvian man, Leonardo da Vinci, 1533, Italy. Big change in time called the Renaissance. Well, it was kicked off then. It took a couple of hundred years, right? where it was no longer uh, all about, you know, the dogma, but about humans. And now we're having a, a new renaissance. We're surrounded by technology, and I call this the Neoluvian man. Well, Vitruvian, Neoluvian, if you follow my drift, right? And woman, of course, not just man. That thing should go away. Um, so, when we look at this, we say we're surrounded by technology. How do we make the best out of it? How do we actually stay in control? Well, the answer is simple. We're going to need protection. <laughs> right. We're going to have to figure out what is right. I mean, it can't just be yes or no. It is always, it depends. How do you use data? How do you share data? Right. When this becomes reality, we're going to drive in a car that is a conference room, which is already reality if you have the money for it, right? 
if this becomes reality, container ships are going uh, 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 energy neutral right, and being connected. That's going to be really important who's in charge of data. I mean, that is the ultimate question. You know, how do we make that business model? And now our good friends from Facebook launched a virtual reality meeting room. I'm going to spare you the voice of Mark. Just look at the animations here. But basically, uh, you have to check it out. It's on YouTube, right? A virtual reality room, Facebook, right? Where he says that that is him, right? Uh, we can actually hear each other in that room in, in a spatial relationship. Imagine when that becomes possible. No more just boring Zoom. Even Zoom has gotten pretty cool as well. <laughs> right? I mean, the world is changing around us in mind-boggling paces. And here's the key message. Many of the stations that we've known will switch off. Okay? That is just like old television. You can't get analog television in most countries anymore. Africa, yeah. Over the air, right? It's digital. I mean, this is what's happening. We're moving to this world. Get used to it. Fragmented, fast, chaotic. Right? The next 10 years will bring considerable change, a sort of new human renaissance, which I'll talk about, but also a huge amount of chaos. Chaos and confusion. Is that good? Yes, I think it is. Every reset has chaos and confusion. We have to start somewhere by saying, well, it isn't working. What we did before COVID wasn't working. We knew the pandemic was coming. Right? Bill Gates told us, and Larry Brilliant told us, and hundreds of and we said, OK, well, it doesn't matter. We don't want to spend the money. We knew climate change is, is real. Right? Car companies say, well, you know what? It's nice. We have to have a powerful car for people like me right? so we can get our margins. Business as usual is dead. And again, that is a good message. I mean, obviously, the people in this show have understood this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called IA mobility. <laughs> it's like, yeah, business as usual is dead. You are lucky in the car industry that the business is still going on as it is. In five years, not a single person will buy a regular engine car. Well, that exception being, of course, in some countries where they're not available, <laughs> right? So it's not all that black or white, but we're going to change dramatically fast. And that's going to be all the stuff that was science fiction, like you know, the, the flying car, 450,000 for this Joby, and of course, all the shared transportations. You've seen all that stuff. It's coming. But here's the bottom line. When we have digital transformation, we also have societal transformation. And then we have human transformation. Make no mistake about this. When we change technology, when we change things that are so exponential, we're changing the way society works, and you are responsible for the changes you create. Okay. Years ago, technology companies said, you know what, uh, if people want to use our software to build uh, authoritarian states with our face recognition software, then, you know, there's not much we can do. Right? Now, the CEO of Salesforce says, we're not going to sell our Salesforce software to companies who are in the business of bad things. What a hard to define what exactly that is, <laughs> right? But we have to applaud him for trying it. It's a social transformation that's happening all around us. There, this is what's happening now. Now we have climate change, and now we have human change. The externalities of climate change, we know. The externalities of human change, manipulation, bias, uncertainty, fear, erosion of democracy. Well, I need to think about this a little bit more. Would you trust Facebook or Google with your personal DNA data? Well, I think most of you would say, well, that's quite unlikely, right? Would you trust that they do the right thing with it and not use it for other things? I mean, these are big topics, and this is why I've been calling for a while for this. And some countries have, since then, that was five years ago, brought that into, into place. So the Digital Ethics Council is essentially the idea of saying we're going to need wise people who are going to define what the future is and how to take care of it. And we need that for the car industry. Because not all technology is good. 
IBM, which I think is the sponsor of the day, uh, they recently announced that they were going out of face recognition as a, a major business because most of it wasn't used for good purposes. Right. Interesting angle, I had to think about this. Ethics is known the difference between whatever you are allowed to do, what technology allows us, and what is the right thing to do. And this is where we in Europe, I know this audience is global, but this is where we can take the lead in Europe. What used to make us slow, which is value and moral concerns, that's the future. That is our ticket to the future. Because many things in technology are amazing, like this, you know, using uh, Synthesia AI, we can instantly lip sync. In this video, you will learn how to react in the case of an unhappy customer in one of our stores. O atendimento ao cliente é fundamental e é necessário aprender a lidar com clientes irritados e descontentes. Well, that's pretty impressive. Podem não ter recebido o nível de serviço Could be esperado. useful. And he, here we have the robo dog. I've never seen nothing like this before in my life. Do you see this? This is a robo dog used by the London Police Department. Since then, has been cancelled. Right? because the effect on the population wasn't as desired. And here's our friend Elon with his Neuralink. Basically, just drill a bunch of holes into your brain and connect to the internet, and then you, you can be superhuman. Right? Sounds like a great idea. I mean, for making money, at least. Uh, many scientists say that amounts to suicide, but hey, you know, it's Elon. What can we say about Elon? Uh, all his stuff is brilliant. Too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. Too much connectivity, too much surveillance, too much data, too little control can be a very bad thing. It doesn't mean that all of data or all of AI is a bad thing. We have to find compromises. You see the Amazon blimp? This is, a, uh, of course, a mock-up, right? It's not real. <laughs> but delivering from the cloud right? with the drones dropping. I can see that already happening over Cologne, and then people would just take their you know, guns and shoot it down. And here we have the Tesla bot that uh, the brilliant Elon has announced. That is definitely science fiction. So as we're moving into this future of where everything is possible, here's the key question. The key answer to that is for me, everything should be as connected and smart as necessary, but not more. Maybe that's a typical German answer, I don't know. <laughs> but hey, it's good to be connected. But overconnected, that's bad. That's like saying now eating food is bad. Now eating food isn't bad. But eating food all day long, every second, and will kill you. So we have to find out what the compromise is, where we're going. And that has a lot to do with mobility, because mobility is about data right, and connectivity. And as we look at the future of AI, this is one of the most misunderstood topics in the world. Because we're watching too many movies from Hollywood and Netflix about what allegedly AI can be doing. Right? You want to know about the future? Don't watch those movies. They're entertainment. They're sell because they create fear. Right? And here's the thing that's happening with AI, very important. Initially, we have what I call IA, intelligent assistance. That's 98% of what we have today. That's all the stuff we talk about here is IA. These machines are not intelligent, like humans. They're not self-running. They're self-learning. They use machine learning. But there are fa fancy software. Right. And that's graduating towards AI, which could be more freestanding, more human-like. But AGI, artificial general intelligence, why would we want that? And who needs it? Right. Well, Elon needs it so he can launch more public companies. So Stuart Russell, the guy who writes mostly about AI, he says basically what's happening, that AI should be about competence, not consciousness. That is the path for Europe to the future of AI. Let them just do the damn job. Right? Better than humans, you know, if, if they can. But I don't want the AI to think and be sentient and to have human agency compete with me. Let them take the routines. So this is really what's happening here, right? I mean, if we're looking at this uh, volume of information as it goes up over the years, you've seen this a million times, this is the number one question. 
who do you trust? If it's going to be about mobility, car sharing, electric cars, autonomous vehicles, who do you trust to do the right thing? Not just to get the job opportunity, if you're in the mobile business, is to build trust. The companies that lose trust will lose everything. Facebook is on the best possible path to this, in my view. And this is what's happening, of course, with regulation. It's all about trust and how we do this together. A short excursion as to what digitization does to humans. You've heard about GPT-3, the AI that can create human-like results by typing commands. Like this app here, you can watch it on YouTube. It's talked, learn from anyone. And learn from anyone is basically you go to a box and you type in a question for Elon Musk or Peter Drucker or anybody else that, that you want to talk about, and it gives you an answer, a live answer. Right. It's basically a response bot, a learning bot. Right. But of course, any of you who are on this tour, they know what's happening. This system is going to a large depository of millions of possible answers. And it's picking the keywords in the most interesting way. But it has no idea who Elon is. It has no idea what the question is. It has no idea who I am. It just puts it together in a really amazing way. Right. Good story about this. A Swiss couple traveled to Rio, older Swiss couple. They arrived in the evening. They wanted to go to um, um, a, a city uh, nearby, about 50 kilometers away. And the application, Google Maps, said this is the quickest way and it led them to one of the most dangerous favelas in Rio, because it's the quickest way. Right? Well, that is true at 12 in the morning, but not at 8 in the evening. It is the, most, the best way to get killed, to go there at 8 p.m. And they certainly were almost killed. What does it say about Google Maps? Well, it's, you know, <laughs> we need a few upgrades there, but really what's happening is that AI doesn't know the context. It doesn't know why it's important. It doesn't care. It's efficient. Now, Google Maps can learn this, right? But think about the implications of this. Think about what it means for us. If you have kids, you've got to think about this. This is the pyramid of work of the future. And as AI has taken over all of routines and logic, this part, right? Huh? Intellectual knowledge, AI can have that. Data information, that's a commodity. Your job isn't data and information. You're not a robot, you're not a machine, you're not data. Algorithms are different. Humans are not algorithms. So here's our job in the future. That's how you're gonna save your career and maybe your company, by having tacit knowledge, deeper knowledge, wisdom, understanding. That's what our kids have to learn in school. That's why they need to learn more than just science. Humanities. I mean, I grew up, I was a musician and producer. I went into the tech business, so I, I'm always drawing from that background. It's really important that we head in this direction. As machine learning is exploding, big topic here at this conference, on the flip side, we have this. We have the things that make us human. Try for a machine to do those things. To have empathy for a machine, come on, yeah? Machine doesn't exist. Values, consciousness, this is our future. Awesome humans on top of amazing technology. And that is so true for the car industry. There may be less wor people working in the car industry because of decarbonization. Yes. But if you take a look at the music industry, again, the comparison, you have about 200,000 people who are now working on Spotify-related offerings, data feeds, tour planning. 21 million people work on social media. That didn't exist 10 years ago. I guarantee you 75% of all the jobs in the car industry or mobility industry in 10 years haven't even been invented yet. Many, many new possibilities that come from this collaboration. So, about decarbonization, we're toast. We have 10 years to address urgent things. I mean, the, the stats are pretty clear on this. It would, it would actually be happen quicker, quicker than we think, right? We used to think of that as a 20, 30-year time frame. Now it's 10 years. Right? We are now at a point where the biomass of what we have created, asphalt, concrete, 
is bigger than the biomass of the Earth. All plant life and animals. We have created more stuff <laughs> than, the, than the Earth has before. This Google Labs shows you what we have done, Google Time Labs, you can watch it on YouTube. It shows you all the things that we have done right, for progress. And I'm with progress. I'm solidly behind the idea of progressing. But COVID-19 was a test run for climate change. Right, why was it a test run? Because COVID gave us a lot of pain and we reacted, and now we have to react even more to get everybody vaccinated. <laughs> and now climate change is going to force us to react without mercy on what we have thought about. Frivolous flying, plenty of that that I used to do. Right. Things that we can afford because nobody's looking. But that's going to change. And that will unfold new possibilities, new things that we have, pain and love, right? This is the pyramid of change. The next 10 years, everything that you know will be shaken up. And I maintain it's 95% opportunity, especially for Europe, as we're gearing up with responses for this. I mean, looking at the stats, everybody is talking about decarbonizing oil companies. Electric cars are reaching parity. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? The numbers are there. But again, let me remind you of this. We will not get there if we keep on going with business as usual. Don't be like the record labels who said for a long time, we are not going to support the internet because it changes what we can do and how we can control things. And who is more important than the record labels now? The tech companies. They own the business. Okay. Take a good lesson from this. So green companies' share prices are exploding. I mean, this is obviously happening everywhere. ESG is exploding. Environmental, sustainable, governmental investing. And yes, in many ways, it's a fig leaf, right? You say, I do sustainable investing, I'm clear, right? You're not. It's a good start, though. Bottom line on this really is, decarbonization is not a degrowth idea. It's not that we're going to have to stop everything that we're doing. We have to stop certain things, like, for example, cruise ships, possibly. Right? It is the biggest opportunity of humanity in the next decade. Decade, not 20 years. Right? It's right here, right now, something that we absolutely can do. And we have to focus on a holistic approach. This is what I like about this event. Right? This is an ecosystem. It's everything put together. It's all the things that we, are, that we like, that we're looking at coming together, because now we have this hype curve that you see many times from Forrester, right? I'll play it again because it's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, if you're looking at the hype curve, the red dots here, the red dots are the next uh, zero to two years. But that means now. I mean, it's amazing how many things are happening now. The orange one is two to five years, and five to ten years is the blue one, and the black one is more than ten years, like fuel cell stationary power. Right. Imagine how many of those things are happening right here, right now, in this hot spot. Consider yourself lucky. So here's a question I have for you when we're looking at this, the future of mobility. I think we will have all the tools, all the techs, all the science, all the money, but do we have the telos, the will, right? Old Greek word is a perfect fit. The will, the wisdom, the purpose. Do we make the right decisions? Do we go through the pain when we have to? Do we fall in love when we can? Of course, this is a question of policy, of government, of everything else. Right? I'm going to wrap up with Reformation. I'm not talking about Martin Luther here or any of those things. Right? I'm talking about, well, a better word is really transformation, but I didn't want to use that word because that's kind of World Economic Forum talk. Right? Here's our good friend um, Milton Friedman, economist who influenced 35 years of thinking about the future. Primarily, businesses are in the business of making money, full stop the shareholder economy. Now, this worked fine for a long time. Well, kind of fine, at least for most of us. Right? But it's utterly broken now. This kind of way of thinking of the future will lead to total disaster. Right? 
That's why I think we need reformation, the art of making an improvement, changing behavior, changing the structure. That that's what we're doing right now. COVID-19 is causing us to say, we need to change this. Not just what we do with healthcare or vaccines, but generally speaking. And so a new doctrine is emerging. I call this people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. You've heard about people, planet, profit before. That's been around for 30 years. I put in purpose because purpose is really important. That is the question of why we're doing something. And who is doing it? Why are we interested in mobility as a service? Why are we building new kinds of engines? Why are well, we doing this? Because we want to uh, achieve a collective good, right? Not just make jobs. I mean, interesting to say, you know, the oil industry makes many jobs. Right? Facebook has many jobs. Sometimes it's interesting to see that the companies who do the worst things for the planet, like Facebook, make the most money. Facebook makes $110 million profit per day. What are they contributing to our future? Well, I'll leave that hanging in the room there. Right? So, new doctrine that's unfolding, especially as we're coming out of COVID. And I would dare say we're going to see a kind of golden era after, we c after we're moving a little bit out of the current crisis. A strange global a golden era where everything is changing and lots of opportunities exist, where we have to be agile, not just functional. Again, pain and love. So here, very important in this transformation that we're pivoting. The car industry is pivoting, the transportation industry is pivoting, the airline industry wants to pivot. That is a tough one, right? Pivot to a new sustainable way of doing things, thinking of new ways, Right, especially three waves of that pivot. Yeah, they're painful, but they're ultimately going towards a total reset of what we are and what we can do. Four points, we have the, ca the catalyst of COVID, climate change, the new economic logic, and of course, inequality. You know that inequality was in a good way before COVID, but now the poor people are getting poorer because of COVID and the rich are getting richer. Right? That's been the result of the crisis. And that's a huge topic when we go into that future. So as we're looking at this, people, planet, purpose, prosperity, I said in the beginning, the future is not a destination, but a new way of seeing things. Lego sees it new. They're, they're rebuilding how they do their bricks with sustainable plastic right? from scratch. I mean, this is much more expensive, right? Swiss Re, a Swiss insurance company, has said they're going to stop supporting insurance claims by oil companies and coal, com right, coal companies primarily. They're going to stop supporting business models like this. Of course, you know what's happening with Shell, and you know what's happening with the vaccine debate. That is kind of breaking our copyright patent concept, right? You've seen what's happening with corporate tax. We're going to see a 50% global tax on all uh, corporations. Coming up, that was discussed for 50 years. That's finally happening, and of course, the Green Deal. You may think whatever you want about the European Commission, <laughs> but they are an engine of that change. This is a tough job, thankless job. And it's really something where we say, okay, this is really emerging here right now. There's even a stock market now for long-term thinking called the LTSE in, in San Francisco. The first two companies went public there for companies who are concerned with the, tr with the quadruple bottom line. So take this as a guideline for the future of mobility and the future of what we can do there. If I could distill it down into one concept that we are pursuing in New Zealand, it is simple and it is this, kindness. Jacinda Ardern, right? the most interesting figure to emerge in the COVID crisis, she says the principle of government is kindness. Right? I mean, think about that. What if we said that here in Germany? That would be quite something. A whole new way of looking at the future. We do. We need a new capitalism. We need a capitalism that's more fair, more equitable, more sustainable capitalism. Uh, capitalism that values not just all shareholders, but also all stakeholders. And if we can put those things together, I think it can be a new capitalism. It be very exciting for everybody. 
Yeah, Mark Benny of the CEO of Salesforce, right, talks about a new capitalism. I mean, these are large stories that are going to impact our choices. We're moving in this world from ecosystems, and God knows mobility in the car industry, there were the biggest egos around. Right? It's basically my way or the highway, or my way is the highway. Right? And now, it's this. Right? Turns out we have to collaborate <laughs> to make this work. That's why we're here. All the OEMs, all the manufacturers, all of the different ideas, all the research, we have to work together to create a new future that's going to be an ecosystem. A mobility as a service is going from ego to eco. Right? And I don't mean that in the green sense, I mean in the overall sense. Right? Collaborating, working together to achieve new things. Right? And this is clearly going to be the way forward into a future that looks like this here on the very left. Right? a totally new ecosystem of mobility. And that ecosystem, I predict, will make more money than what we have now, just like the music industry, after 20 years of decline, is going to stand to make 50 billion a year from streaming. Just get out of the way, right? or be with us. That's been the formula in music that has basically been successful. So let me wrap up with what we do now and how to go forward from here. I want to take you to take this away from today. The future is better than we think. The future isn't dark. The future isn't bad. People aren't evil. When we look around, we could come to that conclusion when we look around when we watch the news, right? Everything is going to hell, but it's not. We're actually solving so many things, and we have solved so many things, and now we can solve more. Right? We have the power to do this when we do three things. Ethical digitization. Decisive and dramatic decarbonization under any and all circumstances. No mercy on what that means. That is what's coming. Societal and economic reformation as how do we achieve that and how we collaborate. You have to understand, of course, the first part, digitization, that's obvious, right? That's why we're here. I mean, you know, do you know anybody who's not digitizing, right? Not transforming? No. Decarbonization, that's a tough one. We're talking about $35 trillion worth of lost assets for the oil industry. That's kind of a hefty amount, right? It's tough, but it'll be widely beneficial in so many ways. And that's becoming obvious. The last one is the hardest one. This is our biggest challenge. How do we agree on what to do? <laughs> right? That's also the purpose of this meeting. We can agree on what is important and what should be done first. So I would advise uh, you to follow these sort of six future principles that I've put together over the years. Exponential change in technology, human change. Holistic, circular, human flourishing, and of course also planetary fl flourishing, not just human. That's kind of the year of the six future principles I would like you to remember. And invest in your future mindset. I've talked about this for years, how important it is to actually listen to the future. 10% of your time should be spent by looking at things that don't yet exist. That's how you're going to get future ready. Future proof? I don't know. Future ready. Right? Doing those four things, investing in your future mindset. Lastly, the most important question of the day is not how we can monetize the most, right? how can we can build a new business, but what kind of future do you want your children and your grandchildren to have? What kind of ancestor are you going to be? Are they going to say about you that you cared and that you made a better future? That is the thought about the future of mobility. Thanks very much for listening. Oh, so much food for thought there, and I wish we had more time. So let me do this as a request. If you got a question, make it a quick question as much as you can. Give it a direct answer because we have about three or four minutes before our next speaker comes in. So who's got a question? Quickly raise your hand and whatever you do, do not touch the mic. Yes, the mic's coming to you, but don't touch it. You know, pandemic, COVID situation. Let's move faster. Quick, 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 as fast as we can. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Great talk. Um, my question is, you quickly talked about the EU. How do you um, can leverage the um, inertia of governments and maybe the EU with the speed that the companies need to have right now? Great question. All right. Well, you know, I think uh, governments are responding to the need for speed already. 
but this is a question of who we vote for and who we ask for, and we get what we deserve. <laughs> it's an interesting angle. I mean, we, we ask companies what we want, we ask governments what we want, and it turns out around the world, you know, the leading politicians around the world, they are women and they're young people. Is that a surprise? No. Uh, we're going to see a lot more momentum there is basically what we ask for. And once we're asking, Gandhi said, 5% of the population pushing for something important, change will come. If we find 5% here that says this is really important, it will happen. Well, that was amazing. Thank you for taking that question. I know there's so much food for thought. I saw the phones out. I was taking pictures as well. It was absolutely amazing. Guys, can we please give a wonderful applause for Gerd Leinhardt? Thank you. Thank you.